the distinct honor and pleasure of saying to you, welcome to Second Baptist Church. And I hope that it does. We have been already learning in our Sunday school classrooms and praying together, and that's a great thing to do. Uh, we have been able to pray with some other folks uh, uh, today that uh, weren't even here uh, for Sunday school class, but at least one guy came by just to pray this morning, and he needed that. Got to visit with him, and so some good stuff happening here at Second Baptist Church, and I am glad that you're here. We're going to kick right off into some good worship, and this stuff's going to help us with that and this wonderful group. You got some good singers up there. We do. We do. Yeah. We have great singers and out we here great as well. I was going to say that. No, you were going to say that. I'm so gonna, sorry. I'm, I'm so gonna. sorry. <laughs> Welcome. As he has said, and we have all said, it is a, a blessing and an honor to be right here in this worship time this morning. We're not any of us here by accident. Some of us had to determine a little bit more to be here this morning and work a little bit harder to be here. But I, I pray and I pray that you know you will be blessed uh, for uh, having been in this worship time this morning. In this very room, there's quite a lot of love and joy for all of us to share. Oh, 
in the great power that you possess, in the majesty that is you, you still said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them be a part. So thank you. Thank you for, instead of just being one to be worshipped and adored and bowed down to, you're one who lets us be useful for your work in your kingdom. And so for those to whom you have called us, we pray. And we ask you, Father, to move mightily in the lives of lost people. And we think of individuals right now who are lost. And God, I pray that you would just, just, just pointedly, plainly, clearly move in their lives with the gospel. Cause our voices to speak it, not just our lives to show it. Cause us to have opportunity to confront people who are lost so that they can know eternal life and they can know the reality of, of, of your presence in even the most difficult and harsh of situations. And that they can know eternity with you will be the end of their time on this earth. So Father, we pray for our friends and our family members and our co-workers and even people we don't know who need to know Jesus. We lift them to you. We ask you for their salvation. And we ask you, Father, for those of us who know you especially, that you would, you would touch our bodies and heal them. There are people in the room right now with, with pain. I pray, God, that you would ease that pain. There are people in the room with sicknesses that are just hanging on. And I pray that you would heal those sicknesses. The people who are struggling right now with, with COVID, and it's such a terrible thing when one gets it. Father, heal them. We pray, and I thank you for the story of healing I heard just before we began our time in this room this morning. And I, and I praise you for that, Father. There are people who are hurting in their homes, perhaps struggling with, with marriage issues or with financial issues. Uh, maybe they're struggling with kids' issues and, and uh, maybe work issues. And I lift them up to you, Father for your mercy and your grace. Give your strength to stand, stand by one more day and, and watch how you're going to work and solve the issues and solve the problems. Uh, so much is going on around us. School's about to start. And for everything surrounding the school situation, Father, we, we lift that up because we can't, we can't hold it ourselves. So we just lift it to you. I pray for the, the, the students who will be in classrooms. I pray for teachers and aides, bus drivers and janitors, and, and, and the people who fix the food, and the folks who keep the grounds, the administrators in the main offices. And Father, you grant wisdom and patience and, and, and knowledge of how to deal with things and, 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 and tenacity to do the right thing and, and uh, the, the ability to study and to learn. And Father, shine in old Mulkey School. Be seen in our in our students and in their parents and in our faculty. Let your kindness be seen in all that's said and done here. Father, bless us. We don't deserve it, but we ask for it. Keep us as we know you will. We trust in that and we rely on that. And as this preacher opens his mouth in a moment to preach, as always, but never trivially, I ask that the words that I speak be yours and not mine alone for this people who will hear it this day, that you may receive glory by our lives changing when we live a little more like you. Thank you, Father, for your love. Most of all, thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.
uh, that when we come together, we worship. But that pastor, his heart was so touched by the reality that the church's hunger for the word of God was declining, even though the church was growing and people were coming and the numbers were increasing, but they were increasing to come and see a very fine, wonderful musical production every Sunday morning. Uh, I hope we can have a fine and wonderful musical production every Sunday morning, but I hope that's not what you come to see, right? Um, you know, it's, it's a fine line that we have to that, that we have to cross. We on stage are not here to have a private worship time. I'm not here trying, oh, I'm just here worshiping, and if you want to, you can worship with me. No, we're here to engage you so that we together engage our Lord. That's, that's what the music is about. That's what the preaching is about. But he got so convinced about that, or so convicted about that, that he took the music out of it. I mean, just one day they came to church and there was no music. He opened the Bible and he read the word of God to them and he preached to them and he prayed with them. And this went on for a period of time. And finally, uh, toward the end of that period of time, I don't know if he wrote it or if a member of his music team wrote it, but he wrote the words to the song that we just sang. When the music fades, all is stripped away. No lights. No fancy sounding instruments. No perfectly blended voices. No well rehearsed timings. And a, and a lot of the, you know, some of y'all don't see this and know this, but those little earpieces that a lot of musicians are wearing, there's somebody talking to them in that. Go to this course, go to this. There's a tick in there. Keeping the tempo. Everything's going, and it's a well-rehearsed, well-choreographed program. But when the music fades, and all is stripped away, the next line says, and I simply come. Would you still come? <laughs> Longing just to bring something that's of worth. I've got nothing that's of worth. But my Lord wants what I bring. So the words to the song came. And as the music began, that, that was the first song that they presented to the Father in that church. And they got back in. And then after some time, they began to sing together again instead of enjoying a wonderfully produced stage show. And they still had a wonderfully produced stage but instead of it being a wonderfully produced stage to present an act of worship from the stage, it became, and I, and I say this to commend those who have just been on the stage with us, to commend an audience to the audience of the omnipotent, omniscient, God Almighty, that together our hearts worship. If I don't hear your voices singing and I don't see in your faces the worship of, of our Lord and, and, and I don't sense in the room an acceptance of the presence of God, we've really missed something even though we have the best music in town. I'm glad you guys joined in the worship and stuff. Thank you for leading in that. Girls on the instruments, thank you so much for that. Voices, how wonderful it is to be able to worship the Lord together. There were three young men in the Bible who worshipped the Lord together. They weren't going to let anything get in the way of their worship of the Lord. They had been taken captive. They had been made slaves along with their friend Daniel. And they had been uh, put into the service of the king. But in the midst of their having been put into the service of the king, they remained faithful to God, which meant what? That they were faithful to whatever services that they had to do. They knew that whatever our hand finds to do, we need to do it all to the glory of God. And that includes if you're flipping hamburgers and McDonald's for $8 an hour. You should do that with the same dusto as the guy sitting on Wall Street making $25 million an hour. Because whatever your hand finds to do, do it all to the glory of God. Do it with all your might. There's several phrases that are in Scripture with that. These guys, they, they knew that. Their names was Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Have you heard of those guys? 
We know him better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These were great guys. I mean, they were friends of Daniel. They were really a foursome, but Daniel's path took him a little differently than theirs, but still in the same arena and still doing the same things. And, and uh, they were given their names. Belshazzar, by the way, was the name given to Daniel. I'm not sure why in Scripture we keep referring to Daniel with his Hebrew name and the others uh, with their captive names. But that's what we did and, and as they were in Babylonian captivity. And, and uh, these guys, they, they made their way up in, in, in what was called the province of Babylon. And as they made their way up, they began to have more and more authority. And let me tell you why they began to have more and more authority because they were faithful in the job that they were given. Joseph, one who was sold into slavery, we read his story at the end of Genesis, was sold into slavery, but he was faithful in his slavery, doing the service to his earthly master as though it was service to God. And everywhere he went, he was promoted. He was promoted in the house of Potiphar. And then he got knocked down by Potiphar's wife. He was promoted into prison, and then he was forgotten by the butcher and the baker, or the butler. Um, he, he was then taken out of that prison and was promoted in the Pharaoh's house until he became the prime minister of all of Egypt, and, and, and God used him. Why? Because he was just faithful. He was a servant of God. Same thing with these four fellows, and in particular today, with those that we call Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. They were faithful in their service to God in spite of the fact that the king under whom they served, this Babylonian named Nebuchadnezzar, he was an evil man. He was a prideful man. He was a selfish man. He loved himself very dearly. Now, I'm one who enjoys his own company just fine. I don't have any problems spending time with myself. In fact, I probably like spending time with me better than anybody else likes spending time with me. I'm just, I don't mind spending time with me at all. And, and so uh, I, I enjoy that. But Nebuchadnezzar was a little bit more than that. He wanted to spend time with other people because they were supposed to spend time with him. They were going to bow down and worship him. They were going to pay him taxes. And they were going to go get his food. And they were going to make him feel good. And they were going to sing his praises. In fact, they sang his praises to the extent that he became so bold that, that he built a statue, presumably a statue of himself. We read about that in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3 and verse number 1. It's one of my, my all-time favorite go-to stories in the Bible. There's so much, so much in here. And as we've been walking through a few stories in the Bible these last few Sunday mornings, I want to come to this one just before I head off to Malawi. Nebuchadnezzar, verse 1 of chapter 3 says in, in the book of Daniel, he was the king and he made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, its width 6 cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Let's see how high that was. 60 cubits, roughly speaking, and uh, for those who are very deep and scholarly into the ancient art of measuring things, forgive me for being simplistic, but a cubit was, and, and any time I measure anything by a cubit, I consider it to be 18 inches. Uh, the reality is that Noah's cubit was different than Nebuchadnezzar's cubit, was different than Daniel's cubit, because a cubit is from the longest point of the tip of the longest finger to the bottom of the elbow. That's a cubit. And we consider that to be about 18 inches. And so if the height of this statue was 60 cubits, then it was about 90 feet tall. Now, let me help you visualize that just a little bit, if I may. See the pinnacle up above your head on this roof? From the floor to the pit point of the roof, way up high there, is 24 feet. Okay? Times 2 is 48 times two is 96, just short of four times as high as this floor to ceiling is, was how high the statue that Nebuchadnezzar made of himself. Have you considered that? Six cubits, nine feet. 
approximately the width of this pea right here. Approximately. Four times as high and approximately the width of this pew was the statue of a man made of gold put in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon and presumably made to look like the king whose name was Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, but that wasn't the end of this man's pride. Not only did he want everyone to look at a god, imagine how much gold it would take to make that. Let's see, gold's about 18 gajillion dollars an ounce right now. It's a, wow. But that wasn't the end of his pride. Verse number two. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image of King Nebuchadnezzar, the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, we don't have satraps these days, and we don't have some of these guys, but you can see by the list of people that he's bringing there, he is bringing all the people who would be considered in the province of Babylon to be important. These are the governors and the mayors. These are the town council members. These are the police chiefs. These are the all these different people. Okay? And he's calling and he said, okay, I've got this 90 foot high, 9 foot wide statue. It's made of gold. It looks like me. You come and we're going to dedicate it together. And so in verse 3, here's what happens. The satraps, administrators, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the officials of his province gathered together. Because when King Nebuchadnezzar says jump on the way up, you ask how high. And, and, uh, and they stood before the image that the king had set up. And then a herald cried aloud, It is commanded, O peoples and nations and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the flute and the harp, and the lyre and the psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Do you see the pride that's in this man? I'm going to build an image nearly four times as high as this building, about as wide as this front pew. I'm going to make it look something like me. I'm going to make it out of gold. And I'm going to call all of the important people from all over the area who I command and who I alone rule over because I am the king of Babylon. And I'm going to bring them together. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to give my best musicians. Music's always been a part of worship, by the way. Go get my best harp players. And, and, and you see all the different instruments, the horn, the flute. The harp, the lyre, which is a small harp kind of thing, and the psaltery, which is, um, uh, some, some people think it was a horn, some people think it was a stringed instrument, in symphony with all kinds of music. Those were the guys back in the early days of contemporary Christian music. They liked this verse. All kinds of music, you know. <laughs> and you shall fall down and you shall worship the image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Boys, when the band starts playing, you start praying. That's what he would say to them. And the command was given as the oracle began to give his, his commandment and share that. And he said, this is what you have to do. Because of the king's pride, he wants you to worship what he tells you to worship. My friend, don't let anybody tell you who or what to worship. Don't let anybody take that from you. You can let them take away your choices that you have about health care. You can let them take away the choices that you have about, uh, about where to buy your groceries. You can let them take away the choices that you have about how to drive and when to drive and where to drive. You can let them tell you how to take, you can let them take away your choices about what you're going to do and how you're going to do it day by day, about how you're going to spend your money, about what you're going to do on your day off, but don't ever let them tell you how you're going to worship the Lord your God. 
Don't let them tell you who the Lord your God's going to be. Because there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And if you have not bowed your knee on earth to Him, you will bow your knee to Him in heaven and you will bow your knee in your shame but to His glory because He is the King of kings and He is the Lord of lords and He is worthy of our worship. Amen. Don't you let any king tell you who you're supposed to worship. You worship the king over all the kings. That's right. But this king tried to tell them that. In verse number 7, so the band started playing. And all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, in symphony, with all kinds of music. And the people, uh, 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 and, and the people uh, of all the nations and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Mm, how terrible it is that in that day and in that time, when everybody had a choice of who to worship, there, fixed. When everybody had an ability to pick who they were going to worship, they chose to listen to the king. I'm afraid, though, and I want to bring that to a contemporary thought for just a moment, if I may. I'm afraid, though, that there's a lot of times in our churches today that when the band begins to play, our worship is not of the king of kings and lord of lords. Our worship is of a wonderful, warm, fuzzy experience that we're having because the music's so good. And the music ought to be good. The music in the church ought to be better than any music out in the world. The musicians that play in church ought to be like the Levites who played in the Old Testament time. I'm telling you, they were talented and skilled musicians who played their instruments perfectly. And they rehearsed and they worked. and they, it, it, was, it was not just something that they came together and threw together. But they had spent years working together. Those Levites who were the musicians. Those Levites who blew the horns at Jericho. They weren't just out there with big ram's horn. Making a big loud un unrecognizable incoherent blast. They were playing music of worship. That's what was happening. And the walls came down at Jericho. And God's name was lifted up. And good things were happening. But I'm afraid in a lot of our churches today that we're worshiping the music instead of using the worship, the music to worship our Lord. Oh, be careful. Oh, be careful. The rule was given that if you do not bow down and if you do not worship, we didn't read verse 6. Whoever does not worship and fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. What furnace was that? You ever think, what, what, what furnace is sitting there? Well, one, in Babylon, they were making a lot of bricks. We know that. But two, we know that they had just made an image of gold that was 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, four times the height of the wide. This is pew. And that's a lot of gold to melt. My, my best understanding of this scripture is this, that the furnace that they were going to get cast into was the huge furnace that was built to melt the gold to make the statue. And gold doesn't melt at a really low temperature. I, I don't know of anybody's hair that could survive the singe of a match, much less a furnace blowing with the heat enough to melt the gold necessary to build a 90 foot high statue. Whoever does not bow down and worship, you're going to immediately get cast into that fire. And so the band began to play and the people began to kneel and the people began to worship this 90 foot high golden image of King Nebuchadnezzar at the command of this prideful king. But I want you to see that that wasn't the end of the story because in that land there were three young men who were children of God who refused to bow down to that idol. I would pray that if that happened today, if we were called upon in our land, in our country, to bow down to an idol, that today more than three people would be around to stand up. And sometimes I worry that perhaps there might not even be one. For we are fearful of the fiery furnace. 
We are fearful of the wrath of the prideful king who might come and take away something that we think we have. And the prideful king thinks that we're afraid of that as well. But there were these three. And in the midst of this prideful king's land, there were some poisonous men. Because when that band began to play, there were three men who stood up. But, oh, hmm. Then there were some of these Chaldeans. Have you heard about those Chaldeans? Those Chaldeans are ugly people. I mean, they just want to stick their nose into everybody's business. Everybody in the land was worshiping King Nebuchadnezzar's idol that he had put up there, except only three fellas. Nebuchadnezzar was happy. He, there wasn't any problem with that. Nebuchadnezzar didn't even know about those three until these Chaldeans came. In verse number, number 8 we read, Therefore at the time certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, live forever. We're on your side. We're your best. You, O oh, King, made a decree that at the sound of all the instruments everybody should bow down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not bow down and worship shall be cast into the fiery furnace. And there are certain Jews whom you have set over Babylon and over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men, O oh, king, have not paid due respect, due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. I, I just think Nebuchadnezzar was just as happy as a pig in a fresh bucket of slop. Until these guys came. And these three Chaldeans came. And they came and made a fuss about these three Jewish boys. If you go back and study what was going on between the Chaldeans and the Jews and what had gone on. You're going to find out why they were so ugly and angry toward them. And so they came in and, 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 and they accused them. And they said, these guys, they're, they're not worshiping like you told them. They're not doing what you said to do. After, oh, king, live forever. While we were bowed down and worshiping with our full attention and our full everything towards your golden image, we noticed that three guys weren't. Which tells me that there were certain Chaldeans whose attention was not where it should have been either. Or at least not where it was expected to be. Hmm. Two guys came to church. I read about this this week. One of them came to church and and he noticed that there was a fellow who really, really needed a bath and it was offensive to him. And he noticed that when the organist played, no, no, no offense to our organist, our organist never does this, but she played three sour notes while she was playing. And one of those vocalists, when she was singing, she was just the slightest bit off key. And he caught the pastor, and you would never be able to do that here, of course, but he caught the pastor in four grammatical errors. And he walked away and he said, I don't know if I'll ever be able to come to that church again because the music, just they, they just don't play it well. And that pastor, he cannot communicate in the English language. Another guy came to church that morning and he heard a rousing organ rendition of a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never fading. And he heard the singers singing together with their heart that says, I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you. I heard the pastor remind them how much Jesus loves them and he went to the cross and died for them and that day repented and gave his heart to the Lord and he left the same church house with a whole different experience because his eyes were where they should have been. Let me tell you something. Whatever it is you worship, you, you give it all your gusto, Okay. If you're going to worship your car, you better always have a good can of wax. And it better, better always be shiny. The gas tank better always be full. The, the spark plugs better always be changed and in good shape. <coughs> your tires better never wear down. If a bug gets on your windshield, you better stop that car right now and scrape that bug off because we can't have that on a car. If you're going to worship your car, you better give it all you've got. But don't worship your car. If you're going to worship a musician, 
You better go to every concert, buy every album, listen to every song that they put out that you can stream and, and, and have their pictures plastered up where you can see them and where you can play their music. And you better go buy the best stereo system that you can buy with the best speakers. None of these little bitty earbud things. I'm talking these big old honking things like we had back in the 70s. Like I still have. And 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 don't just don't just no. You you go all out if you're gonna worship that singer. And keep your eyes on that singer. Or keep your eyes on that car. Or keep your eyes on the stock market. Or keep your eyes on your bank account. Or keep your eyes on your spouse. Or keep your eyes on your child. Or whatever it is that's going to be the object of your worship. You go all out. But may I remind you that every one of those things I have just named will fail you. They will fall apart and eventually they will disintegrate. So I would encourage you if you're going to worship to worship the God Almighty. Amen. And go all out. Right. And put your eyes on him. And don't worry about when the singer hits a bad note, when the organ player misses a key on the pedal or when the pastor ain't got no good talking in him. Start listening to what God would say to your heart. See, these guys were fakers. These guys were guys who said, yeah, we're bound down and worshiping. But we saw of all of the thousands, maybe millions of people who were gathered at the opening day ceremony to dedicate this statue. And the best musicians were in town playing. And everybody's supposed to bow down and worship at this golden image. We saw three people who weren't. Where were their eyes? And where are your eyes when you figure I can't talk as a preacher and I ain't got no good talking? When the singer messes up and <coughs> sing your favorite song and doesn't put it in a key that you can sing to. When the printed material has a typo in it. By the way, I typed that, so if there's typos in it. <coughs> where are your eyes? Let me tell you, if you're going to bow down and worship, you better worship with everything you got. Or you better not bow down at all. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't bow down at all. And King Nebuchadnezzar probably was going along just as happy as he could be, seeing all these people bow down and worshiping and doing exactly like he said. But when he heard about these three people, in verse 13 we read that Nebuchadnezzar in a rage... And in fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they brought them. Verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Now, is it true, fellas? I mean, these were his trusted people that he had promoted in the province of Babylon. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my God or worship the, the gold image which I set up? Now, listen, I'm going to give you a second chance. <laughs> he, he was a fair king, right? He said in verse 15, if you're ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, all the instruments, to fall down and worship, then good. But if you don't, I've got to cast you immediately into the midst of the burning fire. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? The poison of pride. The poison of pride. That made him think he was more powerful than God. Who's the God who's going to deliver? It made him think he was God. I'm going to burn you up in this furnace that just melted all this gold that made this 90 foot high golden sand. Listen, I'm going to do it. Unless you get, come on guys, play ball, play nice. Who's the God who will deliver you from my hands? I'm very pleased to be able to give you the, the, the reality that they had an answer to that question. You know what the answer was that they had to that question. And verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, we don't even need to answer you. Don't you love it? We have no need to answer you in this matter. Our lives have already shown you what the answer is. King Nebuchadnezzar, you know us and you trust us and you know that we are men of integrity. You don't need an answer to this question. Thank you for giving and I appreciate you offering a second chance and everything, but... We don't need to answer you in this matter. You see, if it is the case, if this is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. 
and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, oh, don't you love that? He, he's able. I trust that he's going to. But sometimes, listen, our doubt does not say God's not able. Our recognition that God might not is not a lack of faith. Some people say that when you pray for a sick person, you should pray for their 100% healing and nothing else and not give room for anything else. And even if you say, but God, if you don't want to heal them, that's okay, that that's a lack of faith. Even Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that even though their desire was that God was going to do some great and mighty thing like, like blow out the fire before they could be put in or something, you know. But then they said, if he doesn't, that's okay too. Because you let it be known, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image that you have set up. It's not going to happen. You can put us in the furnace, but it's not going to happen. King, we're not going to worship that image. Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. The expression on his face changed toward these young men who were his trusted friends and fellow workers that he had promoted into the place. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. I don't know the number. I should have looked it up, what the melting point of gold is. But seven times that? Once is enough, isn't it? But seven times? Wow. Verse 30. He commanded certain mighty men of valor who, uh, who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning furnace. And these, then the, these men were bound in their coats and their trousers and their turbans and their other garments. And they were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men and took up, who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace and King Nebuchadnezzar thought that's that you're not going to do what I tell you to do not going to have you around mm. but that didn't last long his satisfaction was quickly quelled as he found himself what the Bible says he was astonished Literally, he was in awe. Literally, he had nothing that he could say. His jaw fell down and hit the ground. His eyes were wide open, so much so that he could not even blink because of what he saw. And he rose and in haste, and he spoke and said, Listen, guys, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of that fire? Oh, yes, King, we absolutely did. Yeah, we put three men bound in that fire. Hmm. Look, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. And they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Amen. Oh, I love that part of the story. Let me tell you something, church. Something that a lot of preachers don't want to tell you, but it's the truth of the Bible. And I can't tell it any other way because that's what the Bible says. God doesn't promise that he will always take us away before we get thrown in the furnace. God doesn't promise that he'll always do away with the furnace or that he'll cool the fire. But God does promise that he's going to be with us and that he'll never forsake us and that he'll never leave us. The Bible says I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And because of the blood of Jesus, you're never going to be forsaken, even if they cast you in the furnace. And even if you burn up, you're still going to be with it. But God wasn't done with him yet. And God wanted people to see them. And, God, and God's not done with you yet. You're going through your trial today. We've all got trials. All of us do. We got people who don't like us. We got people who, who want to steal from us. We got issues in our home that make it hard to, to, to work and do what we got to do because we don't have enough money to pay the bills. All kinds of stuff. By, by the way, I, I, even, even the person with the least amount of stuff that I've ever known of, if a person is faithful, I've never seen a hungry, faithful Christian. I've never seen it. I've been to Africa. I've been to Asia. I have never seen a faithful Christian that God didn't provide a meal for. You just think about that. 
life is so terrible and so bad and I don't have two cars like the other guy does and I don't have a huge house like the other guy does and I don't have 72 changes of clothing. <laughs> I remember a family that we used to deal with and help and then I was working with a grandma trying to raise four children and, and uh, one day I went to their house and, and uh, I was taken out into the garage for some reason and, and there were five people living in this house and I kid you not, there was heaps and heaps of dirt. I'm talking heaps of dirty laundry sitting in that garage waiting to be washed. And I, I remember thinking, I couldn't have that much dirty laundry at my house. I don't have that many clothes. But they did. You know what? They didn't have any money. But they were faithful to the Lord. And God saw to their needs. Amen. And where, when it came to clothing for them in a grand style. How awesome is that? Never, I've never in my life been hungry. Oh, I, I, I wanted food. I, you know, I'm hungry. Okay, there's food. Go get it. But I've never been hungry for lack of food. I've never had to run around with no clothes on. Just get that picture out. <laughs> uh, I've always had a roof over my head. Always had. God's always taken care. Because the home in which I've lived has always been a home faithful to the Lord. And he didn't promise to make us rich like some liars will tell you today. But he did promise to take care of us in our poverty. He didn't promise to clothe us in the finest of linen. But he did promise to keep us clothed. He did promise to feed us the finest of food. And, and, and the sumptuous fairings that the rich man had before Lazarus that day. But he did promise to feed us and he always does. And in the midst of that hunger, in the midst of that not very nice clothing per se, in the midst of that just barely making by food, he did promise to always be with us. Look, I see four. They're not bound by the things that we bound them with on this earth. And they're walking around and they're loose. And the fourth looks like the son of God. He didn't leave them. Was it their faith? Or was it their faithfulness? No, it wasn't either one of those. Instead of it being their faith or their faithfulness, it was the faithfulness of the God whom they served with faith, faithfully, who was there with them and who saved them. And Nebuchadnezzar, verse 26, went down near the mouth of the burning, fiery furnace. Notice he didn't go too close because the other guys already got consumed. And he spoke saying, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. And they came out from the midst of the fire. And the satraps, administrators, governors, kings, counselors gathered together. And they saw these men on whose body the fire had no power. And the hair of their head was not singed. And their garments were not affected by the smell of the fire. It was not on them. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel. Notice that's a capital A. And most people think that this is a Christophany. A pre-incarnate coming of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus appearing before he was born in Luke. And of course in Daniel it would be way before that. Most people look at that. And he said, blessed be that God. He sent his angel to deliver his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any God except their God. Therefore, I wonder what the therefore is when people see your life. You ever thought about that? What's the therefore when people watch you live? What's the therefore when the people listen to your words? What's the therefore? What's the change? What's the notable thing when people have an experience with you or with me? Therefore, I make a decree, he says in verse number 29, that any people, nation, or language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces their houses shall be made into an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Today we have seen the pride of the king that poisoned his heart and the poison of his followers who tried to poison the followers of God. But we have also seen the protection of God 
who walked through the fire with them until it was time to bring them out. And his provision was this, that not only was everyone in the province challenged by the reality of who God was, but even these three servants of God were promoted in the, and they were pretty high up anyway to begin with. But they were promoted in the province of Babylon so that men and women would know there is no other God like this God who can save them from the fire. That's what their therefore was. Their therefore was this, that their God is the most high God. He's the best God. And nothing's going to harm them. But even if my body gets harmed, nothing's going to harm me because my God will deliver. Don't you love that message? Uh, the, the questions that I have for you today are two. Number one is, is, is your service to God so intense that you would be willing to go into the fiery furnace that, that was used to melt the gold to make a 90-foot statue, heated up seven times hotter than it needed to be to melt the gold to make a 90-foot statue because you failed to bow down and you refused to bow down to the statue that the king sets up in the plain of Dura so that people will worship when his band plays. Is your commitment to God like that? I don't know. You better get to know him. You better figure it out. I give you fair warning today. Not because I'm any prophet of any kind, but just because I can see what's happening in the world around us today. That there is coming a day and it won't be very long from now. When you will be forced to publicly make a choice. And it's going to be very difficult if you haven't first privately made a commitment. Do you know Jesus? Have you given your whole life to him so that when you are called upon to publicly make a choice and the king comes to you and says, listen, guys, I'll give you another chance. Either bow down or burn. <laughs> we don't even need to answer that because you know who we are. This is what we stand for. Throw them in the fire. And then comes the therefore. Is your commitment to God so much so that you're willing to be thrown in the fire with confidence that God will see you through that fire? And what will be the therefore on the other side of that fire? Whether your body is consumed or whether your body is saved, what will be the therefore? What's going to happen to the people who see you go into that fire? Will they see God in that fire with you? Will they see God caring for you in that fire? Will they see that anything that the world can do cannot touch you or harm you and even put the smell of smoke on your clothes or in your hair? What's the therefore when people see your life? That therefore is going to make a difference in this world. It will either make a difference that says people will come to know Jesus or it will make a difference to say people are going to run from the very thought of him laughing all the way. Is your life making a difference for the God that you serve? What's the therefore when people have had an encounter with you? I'm, I'm honestly and sad to tell you that every therefore from encounter with me hasn't been the prettiest thing and the best thing and the perfect thing. I thank God for grace for on that, that measure. I just hope to do better next time. <laughs> Listen, there's a therefore with you. What happens after people experience you? In, in this case, in our text today, people got to experience God. What's the therefore after they meet? Bow your heads with me. Close your eyes. No one is looking around. Each one is looking within. In just a moment, we'll stand and we'll sing our hymn of invitation. As we stand to sing that hymn of invitation, two things are being asked of you. Number one, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you given your heart to him? Is everything that you have and everything that you are committed to his service, to his worship? If not today, you need to give your heart to Jesus. If not today, you need to turn your life over to Him. I can't tell you whether you are or not, because that's between you and God, but I can tell you how. 
you simply admit to him that you know that you've broken his law and because of that you've broken relationship with him and you ask him to forgive you and he will and you ask him to help you follow and he will do you need to come to Jesus today How, how's your therefore something needs to be worked on there Maybe today, right where you are, you would pray. Make some fresh commitments to God concerning what people see when they see you. How's your therefore? So, Father, we pray in this place at this time. You would help us to know how to respond to what we've heard this day. May your will be done in every life present, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You stand with me, please, as we sing. You come, would you please? Well, thanks once again for being with us here at Second Baptist Church. And, and, I, and I'm just praying that God spoke to you today as we have worshiped together with music and opened his word. And, and if he has, and if you need some help with next steps, would you please contact us? There's a lot of stuff on this forum you can use to get us in whatever your favorite kind of contact method is. We'll be looking for your message and we'll be looking to try to help you know how to take a next step with God. And if you don't have a place to worship every Sunday and you live here in the Oak Mulgee area, come on by. We would just love to have you right here in the house next time we gather at Second Baptist Church. God bless you and thanks for joining us today.